All right, hello and welcome to Horse Chats. We're so excited to saddle up and talk about all things equine this month. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Brittany Sweeney. I'm the communications manager at the Livestock Conservancy. With me today is Charlene Couch, our senior programs manager, and Christy Reich, GM of El Campion Farms. We're excited to have them both here today. Um, quick reminder to please leave us a comment on Facebook and we'll get to your questions at the end of our chat. Uh, feel free to let us know you're here and what you want to talk about. Um, before we get started, I just want to say thank you to the NC Horse Council and to Premier One for making programs like the Horse Chats possible with their generous support. Um, if everybody's ready, let's get started. Charlene, do you want to introduce our guest? Yeah. Thank you, Christy. This is Christy Reich, who is coming to us live from Thousand Oaks, California, um, where she's the general manager of El Campion Farms. And the reason she's here today is to talk about Santa Cruz Island horses, who are within the, the group of colonial Spanish horses. Um, Christy, do you want to do you want to talk about colonial Spanish horses really quick and let everybody know what that is? And then we'll dive into the Santa Cruz story. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you and everybody today. Um, the Spanish colonial horses are related to the horses that were brought over on the Spanish galleons from Spain during kind of Spain's colonialism um, of uh, the Americas. So the history tells us, you know, that they arrived in uh, Central and South America and with the Spanish missionaries and the Padres kind of worked their way up through California. So um, as best we know through the genetic testing that we have um, now, these horses are related to all of these other little subgroups of Spanish colonial horses that you will find around the United States. All right. So one of one of the several of those Spanish horse um, descendants is the Santa Cruz Island horse. Um, can you give us some background on on how they came to to be on the island and yeah. what you're doing with them? Yeah. So the history of the Santa Cruz Island um, horse is pretty interesting and it's a little bit dodgy the further back you go. But what we do know is that they were ranching um, on the islands back in the 1800s and they were um, ranching merino wool sheep. So it were it was um, Italian immigrants that had brought over, you know, these wonderful sheep, and they had sheep and vineyards. And I would guess that they were farming or ranching out there because there were no real predators. So you could really just focus on raising your sheep, and then once they were ready for market, you know, you would shear them, you know, sell the wool, put it on the boat, and get it back over to the mainland. Um, there were uh, several families over the decades that had ownership of different parts of the island and eventually ranching out there just became, um, too expensive and too difficult. And if you didn't really closely control the sheep, they, the population would get out of control and they would, they did overgraze the island. So at some point, these ranches became kind of abandoned and for whatever reason they left these horses behind and with sheep and wild boar and um over the years you know the horses had kind of eked out eked out a living um on the island along with these other animals made it through a couple of pretty intense droughts um so Eventually, though, the island was um, taken over by the Nature Conservancy and then a percentage of it taken over by the National Park Service. So when that happened, there was a big um, effort to remove all of the non-Indigenous animals off of the island. So when that happened, there was a group of um a group of people very concerned about the welfare of the horses, mostly from the Santa Barbara area, who were trying to get them to be able to stay on the island. That, you know, this small group of horses, let's say 19, 20 horses, they were not the ones responsible for the overgrazing, it was the sheep. So a very long and expensive legal battle um, was launched 
And eventually they did end up losing the battle to leave them on the island. So in 1998, um, 19 horses were removed and they were sent to a sanctuary in Northern California. But what was interesting and kind of unfortunate is that the sanctuary is in a very rural part of California and there's predators. These horses had no clue about predators. So um, there was loss um, of part of the herd due to mountain lions, um, you know, kind of going after the young horses or kind of senior horses. So um, the one of the volunteers and one of the members of the board of that sanctuary uh, opened up her small ranch um, also in Northern California and started taking in some of these horses or at least the young horses. And I think back then is actually she started to become involved um, with the Livestock Conservancy and just kind of reaching out for scientific help on the best way to help preserve the, the herd. So I think that was <laughs> kind of it in a nutshell. <laughs> well, how did, how did you become involved um, down in Thousand Oaks with, with these horses? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So the owners of El Campion Farms, and I'll kind of go back a little bit. So we are very, very involved at the highest levels of show jumping um, for many years. So we actually had a horse in the 2008 Olympics that um, we won a gold medal in team show jumping. And, you know, sort of like the pinnacle, the peak of all of our competition efforts. And after that, we started to wind down that part of the operations. The owners of the farm, their children had gone on to college and there wasn't kind of the big push to have all these big competition horses anymore. So we were at a point in wanting to kind of redefine the farm and you know, what were we about? And um, in about 2013 or so, 2012, they started getting into goats and wanting to um, have a small herd of goats and make goat milk products. That led them to the San Clemente Island goat, which is another breed that I know that Livestock Conservancy works with. And so we acquired a small herd of San Clemente Island goats. Through that, we found out about the Santa Cruz Island horses um, because they were, um, both herds were kind of around the same part of California. And the owners of El Campion Farms spent about a year in um, communications and discussions with the owner of the largest number of kind of privately owned Santa Cruz Island horses. And they knew that she really loved the breed and wanted to help save them, but knew that her resources were being stretched. So it took about a year of negotiations. And in 2014, we acquired 13. Um, so we had, let's see, three stallions, six mares and four geldings. And, you know, they they came down to California and or down to Southern California to the farm. And um, it was a little bit of a shock for me coming from kind of the high performance world and kind of these little scruffy, they're technically ponies. And, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do with these guys? So, you know, we focused the first year really on breeding and we wanted to make sure that we were keeping up with the numbers because at that point there were less than 50 left in the world that we wow. knew of. And um, so we made a big push with that. And we had, there was one mare um, that had come from the island and we did two um, embryo transfers um, from her. And we we're very, very lucky to have gotten a mare and a filly. Um, from that mare. And um, that's kind of how, that's how it started was this, you know, this group of, of ponies that arrived in 2014. And now we have uh, 23. Wow. That's excellent. Yeah. So, um, how many Santa Cruz horses are, are there now in the world, do you think? It's, it's a hard answer. I, I don't actually know the full answer. I'm going to yeah. guess that we're maybe 35 to 40. 
Unfortunately, there was a herd that went to Florida and um, with all very good intentions, but as can happen with a lot of rare breed preservation, um, you know, it's very dependent upon the farm owners to kind of keep it all going. And from what we know, um, the owner of that herd um, fell ill. And I think that there was a big herd dispersal and we don't know what happened to those horses. We've tried, and I know the Nature Conservancy has tried to, to track them all down, but um, that was kind of an unfortunate loss of uh, genetics. So as far as we know, you know, there's probably about another 15 or so um, in Northern California. And um, we have our 23. And kind of as we go along, we're about six years into this, you know, it is our intention to um, be able to sell, you know, kind of have a big enough herd that we can then sell, um, sell some off and then just start kind of keep it, keep it going beyond us. That is our ultimate goal for sure. Sure. Yeah. It sounds like the population is really in trouble without you guys. Yeah. Yeah. So a little band of scruffy horses and yeah. I've seen some videos of some amazing performances by your horses. Um, they yeah. don't look scruffy to me at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was sort of the big question I asked myself when we first got them is that, you know, if you think back about any breed of anything, any kind of livestock animal, they're all bred for a purpose, you know, whether it's to plow a field, whether it's to travel long distances, um, whatever it may be. So the kind of my job I felt was to find a, a an appropriate job for these horses where they would shine and thrive. And they didn't really fit into any, any kind of typical um, horse world, you know, uh, sports. So we had tried, and it also depends upon what's available wherever you're at, you know, so what do you have available to you? Um, there were some Vaquero type competitions, which we took them to, um, and people were interested in them, but they are small, you know, so they don't really lend themselves to, you know, a larger statured person. Um, we then found um, Western Dressage and we just felt, okay, that's a great place to start. It's a great basis for absolutely anything that you're going to be doing. From that, we discovered um, working equitation and working equitation is a sport um, with its origins in um, Portugal and it comes from their ranching background and it's a three phase sport. So you do a dressage test in what they call a short court. So it's a 20 meter by 40 meter dressage court. And then you do um, ease of handling round. So it's sort of like dressage, but around very specific obstacles for kind of each level. And then there's a speed round. And so we took our horses to their first working equitation show. And it was like, you know, the light bulb went off and like, this, this is it, this is, you know, what they can thrive in and shine in. And what's wonderful about the sport in the U S is that it's non-denominational. It doesn't matter what breed of horse you're on. It doesn't matter if you're Western or English or Portuguese tack or whatever it is, as long as, you know, it's correct and good horsemanship and good riding. So, um, we really leaned into that and um, so have been showing in that for about the past three years. And it's been such an amazing and really, really fun journey um, with these horses. So they have kind of a big uh, fan base <laughs> whenever we go to the horse shows. And, um, you know, these horses, I think because they, they evolved on the island, they're um, they have such nice calm dispositions and not much bothers them. And um, which is also great for a show horse. You know, we get them to the horse show and they're like, all right, whatever, you know, when is lunch? So <laughs> it helps though when you're, you know, trotting down center line and a dressage test and they're just trotting along, you know, relaxed and, and, you know, they can do a nice test. And so, you know, we get some nice scores because they just have these lovely dispositions. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what we've been focusing on is the Western dressage and the working equitation. Um, yeah, and it's just been a blast. 
Wow. That yeah. Like fun. It, it does sound like fun. And I encourage you all who are who are out there with us um, to go check out the Santa Cruz Island Horse website because there are some amazing images of these horses at work. And it just makes my little heart better patter. <laughs> well, let me put that out. up for everybody. Yeah, thank you. Down at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, the, the movements are beautiful and uh, they just seem like such a level headed horse. Yeah, they really are. It's, you know, we have a um, an American pain horse that we take along to horse shows with us and he loves to show, but it's so interesting kind of pulling a Santa Cruz Island horse off of a trailer and then pulling the American pain horse off the trailer at a horse show, you know. And again, the Santa Cruz Island horses are like, well, this is, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, you know, the American pain horses, you know, head is about to explode. So, you know, but it, they really, really appreciate how lovely it is, you know, to take these Santa Cruz Island horses to shows, you know, because they get right on and off the trailer and, you know, they're just so easy, easy to deal with. And, you know, they all, they live outside. They love to live outside. Um, so that's kind of how we manage them is um, it's a little bit hard when you're showing is their coats, you know, you have to make a lot more um, effort to make sure that they look nice for the show ring. But, um, you know, they're, they're happy to live outside. So that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how they, how they were uh, adapted, I guess, on the Island. Uh, that's yeah. A pretty, yeah. Pretty rugged existence, I would think. Yeah. And what's interesting too, is that because they evolved um, through, you know, living, living wild on this island, they developed a very thrifty gene. Um, so we have to be very, very careful about how we feed them. So uh, literally every single meal that they get is weighed out. So they all live on um, Timothy hay and it's, um, every single horse has their, their different weight of how much they're eating and they get, you know, minor supplements just to kind of balance out um, the vitamins and minerals. But other than that, they're very, very easy keepers. Right. That's great. Right. Well, the population is so tiny, right? And what are you guys doing in terms of genetic conservation? Yeah. So Kind of going back a little bit further, you know, the first two years um, we bred within within the group that we had and we discovered, you know, there was a lot of weird, weird kind of things that were happening with them orthopedically and health wise. And we could only really chalk it up to just the level of inbreeding. Um, so we decided to take a year off from breeding. And we really took the time to regroup and we researched and looked at all different um, types of Spanish colonial horses that were basically west of the Mississippi. And what we discovered were, were issues that were related to either logistics or just not the right match for our horses. So for me, one of the most important things was maintaining, you know, when you're looking to outcross, you're trying to find the best match in different ways. And, you know, kind of going back to the showing, one of the hallmarks of these horses are their dispositions. So it was important to me to find like horses that had just good, calm, reasonable um, dispositions. Then, then you're also looking at the body type. And the other thing that we were looking at and kind of orthopedically were for good kind of short, strong pasterns. One of the things that we've run into with these horses that we have anecdotally um, deduced uh, due to inbreeding is DSLD. So um, degenerative suspensory ligament dysmitis. And it is a very unfortunate disease that several breeds suffer from, but we had kind of considering the small amount of horses that we had a large portion of them, not a large portion, but a, a significant percentage were suffering from, from this disease. And what it looks like is the back pasterns will be so dropped that the, um, the pastern is almost um, parallel to the ground and it ends up with a hawk kind of, a, it looks like a, they call it a stovepipe hawk. Um, it ends up being a very, very painful disease um, for the horses, which eventually results in having to euthanize them. 
Um, so we had had two that had, you know, we had to put down from that. And so that year that we took off, it was kind of all these kind of things that check off, you know, we wanted to check off the boxes. And, you know, if we did find some interesting Spanish colonial horses, they didn't have the logistics in place, you know, so to breed, you know, you need the other stallion owners to either be collecting or they have some frozen, um, that type of thing. You know, we weren't willing to send our mares to somewhere else because, you know, you can only control your management. You know, it's hard to control somebody else's management of your horses. And with that small of a number, it was just too risky for us. So through this year and working with um, an animal science PhD from UC Davis, we actually circled back around to kind of um, the origins of these horses is back to the Iberian Peninsula. So the, now you're looking at an Andalusian or Lusitano and the Baroque style Lusitanos for us kind of checked a lot of the boxes. So we looked for smaller um, Lusitano with a really nice kind of short compact body style and really good in the brain. And we found a, um, a Palomino Lusitano down in San Diego. And that was our first um, outcrossing. And then the year after, then we got um, two colts from that breeding. And the disposition, we can tell so far, they're two years old now. Um, the disposition is right there. Um, they're lovely, lovely horses. And we're, you know, it's, it's that impatient time, you know, until you can get on their backs. Um, you know, where we're at right now. And then the year after that, we bred to a different Lusitano stallion um, that was uh, showing and working equitation. And we have two fillies um, from, from that stallion. And last year, what we did was we had actually found a very um, old style of um, Andalusian mare. So we had focused on the um, mare side, um, the, yeah, so the mare, so getting the out the outcrossing from the stallion side the last two years, this past year, we focused on um, our stallions outcrossing to that side. So we have kind of a good mix that we'll be able to play with over the next few years. So we found an Andalusian cross mare um, that looks just like a slightly larger Santa Cruz Island horse um, that we bred one of our stallions to. And then we found a mare in Texas that we actually just, that we leased um, for the gestation. And we bred our stallion to that mare. And that's kind of where we're at right now. So um, we're in that kind of waiting period to see how these horses grow up. And, you know, we will be very, very critical. You know, we realize like, I don't want to make any of these decisions, you know, in a vacuum. And we take our responsibility for this breed and our stewardship of it very, very seriously. So, you know, we try to be as objective as possible, you know, and fortunately kind of again, circling back around to kind of the working equitation and showing them, even if they, if I don't think that they will be good to cross back into the Santa Cruz Island horses, we will have lovely horses, you know, to sell who have a nice reputation, um, you know, in these types of competitions. Christy, do you have time for questions today? I, I do. Can, so, so just a reminder to everyone, if you still have questions, go ahead and post them and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Start with a comment from Susan Suber. Hi from South Carolina. Hi, Susan. Thanks for tuning in today. Let's see, what else? Sorry, my mouse is not working. <laughs> Uh, let's see, Gretchen McGuire, what breed? We are talking about Santa Cruz horses today, um, colonial Spanish, so just in case. Um, shine and thrive from Trucha, uh, Anna Trucha. So I think that was from your earlier comment about giving them their jobs back so they can shine <laughs> and thrive, which we want for all, all animals. Um, are we referring to Morgans? Lori Kidd wants to know. She's written an um, are there any kind of comparisons to Mor 
Morgan horses? I think that they are actually. And in the genetic um, studies that I have seen, they are, they are related. So yes, I, I, I would absolutely say they're all kind of in that same that same family, but they're, they're, and that has been suggested that we outcross to Morgans. All right. Gabrielle Gordon wants to know uh, what colonial Spanish breeds are Santa Cruz related if to any of the SC breeds? Um, no, well, it, that's kind of a hard question question to answer that directly. So if you talk to a geneticist, they're going to get really into the weeds about it. Um, but the Santa Cruz are really kind of off on their own, you know, literal and figurative island. Um, you know, I think if you kind of go back with all of these, you know, all the different um, Mustang braids and the Wilbur Cruz and you know, all these different, um, like the Sulphur Springs Mustangs and everything, I think you can kind of find the origin of all of those are going to go back to those, the the Spanish colonial or the horses that were brought over on the Spanish galleons. Um, as far as being related to any kind of current um, herd or breed, I haven't seen any evidence um, that they are. They kind of went off on their own on their own branch. All right. Joyce says, Santa Cruz sound lovely. Do you DNA and parentage verify to avoid close line breeding? We do. So um, we, you know, kind of in, in the, the original horses that were brought off the island, um, the, the herd steward was working closely with um, geneticists um, to, you know, you can't avoid um, line breeding, you know. Um, and I've heard, you know, there's a saying, you know, it's line breeding. If it's successful, it's inbreeding. If it's unsuccessful. Um, so you can't really avoid it. But I do use a software program now um, to cross just like the smallest percentage as possible. Um, that wasn't always done in the past prior to us. Um, so we are definitely doing our best to kind of, um, you know, keep those percentages as low as possible. And we do, um, we do genetically test everybody and we microchip everybody. Um, again, just trying to kind of tick all the boxes and kind of good, be good uh, breed stewards. Great. Anna wants to know any comment or knowledge about Wilbur Cruz horses with this breed. Yeah, so we've actually um, seen uh, one of the Wilbur Cruz herds and um, that Robin Collins has and they're lovely, lovely horses. And, um, you know, I know she's been working hard to try to save them. They they weren't a great match um, physically, but also there were the logistics. Um, and it was a herd that we were considering, or breed that we were considering outcrossing to. Um, but, you know, it was kind of both of those things that, that kind of kept them off of the list for when we decided to uh, work on our outcrossing project. All right. So Regina and Lily, who is seven, wants to know how many horses do you all have all together? So we have currently 23. Um, we had to put um, two down due to the DSLD and we lost one stallion um, when he was away at a breeding farm to be collected. And we lost a mare um, that was a senior mare um, that had a rupture when she was being palpated and it's a risk that you take, you know, when you are doing reproduction. Um, so, but we do have 23 on the ground at our farm. Um, we had a little filly born um, at the beginning of uh, quarantine. Um, so that was sort of a, a fun distraction and she is turning out to be just a really cool, cool little spunky filly. And, you know, it's always fun 
fun to have babies in the house. <laughs> and we do have, so this year um, we were able to successfully breed our um, junior stallion to three of our mares. So um, yeah, we're super excited about that. That's great. Thank you, Lily. What a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's all that I've seen come in so far. Um, if there's any more, we can chat a little bit. Is there anything else you think we should know about Santa Cruz horses that maybe we didn't talk about today yet? Oh yeah, one of the things um, that we worked on last year is um, establishing what we call a frozen farm. So we're working really closely with UC Davis. And what we did was um, you take a skin punch, um, it's just a small, you know, small uh, skin tissue sample and you put it in a special solution, send it off. Um, we sent it off to UC Davis. And what they do is they grow fibroblasts from that um, skin, uh, the skin tissue. And so we have fibroblasts on every single um, kind of 100% Santa Cruz Island horse. So we have their genetic material in perpetuity. Um, we, kind of at the beginning of this, there were some things that we didn't know about uh, genetic material and also reproduction and the stallion that we lost. We didn't realize at the time that we could have um, salvaged semen from his testicles um, right after, you know, he had to be put down. So we're making sure that that never happens again. Um, so we kind of have standing orders um, with the vets that we work with that if something happens to one of our stallions and you know I, I'm away or, or nobody can reach me, they know um, that that is part of the protocol um, if uh, one of the stallions has to be put down. Um, you can do that with the mares as well, but it's a little bit more of a, a difficult, um, difficult process. But um, that has been a really important thing for us just to kind of uh, preserve genetic material because you just don't know you know, what's gonna be coming down the pipeline with all the advances in um, uh, reproduction and cloning and things like that. That sounds really important. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. I'm so glad you're doing that. We, we really recommend, you know, for, for some of these heritage horse breeds, the numbers are so low and some of the bloodlines are being completely lost. Um, so the work that you're doing is, is exactly what we would like to encourage other folks to do with, with uh, especially important bloodlines or, or really old bloodlines. Oh, thank you so much. It's been such an incredible kind of educational journey for me. You know, I, I kind of went into reproduction, kicking and screaming and, you know, not wanting to kind of deal with it. And it's turning out that I actually really love that part of it. And I love kind of the science part of it and the whole process of it. And um, yeah, and then, then working with the geneticists and, you know, half the time they're talking to you and I have no idea what they're talking about because they can get really <laughs> technical. Um, but I'm grateful to have them on our side. And, um, you know, again, I, you know, we never want to do any of this in a vacuum. And our biggest goal is for this, for this herd to survive, you know, beyond us. So, um, the, that's definitely, definitely our goal is to kind of showcase and highlight and, you know, really kind of acknowledging that we are preserving kind of a living piece of history and, Absolutely. and kind of the weight of that. That's right. It was actually your horse, horse herd that inspired um, the writing of our equine tissue preservation manual. Um, oh, it, it was heartbreaking that, that you had to lose that animal because vets didn't understand all that could be done. And so we're, yeah. we're trying to spread the word and we appreciate all you're doing in that regard too. Oh, Absolutely. wonderful. I know we're really excited about that, the, the guide that you guys are coming out with. Yeah, thank you. Well, we've got a few more questions that have come in if we've got time. Sure. Let's see, we have Stephanie and she wants to know, we're glad you're here even if you're late. So thanks for coming. <laughs> Um, are you still breeding to the Lusitanos? We are. So um, we don't have, like this year we decided to focus on our junior stallion. Um, but I have, I always have my eyes open for kind of, uh, you know, a great small mare or a great small stallion. And I've got, you know, friends of mine that are 
um, kind of a little more deeper in the Lusitano world than I am um, keeping their eyes open for me. So, you know, it's really about the temperament and the size um, and just sort of a good, good kind of nice compact body that we're looking for. So um, yeah, definitely keeping my eyes out all the time. Good question. Also wants to know if someone is interested in learning more about working equitation, where can they go? Um, great question. So there's actually two, um, two organizations in the United States that literally a week ago just, just finally agreed to um, form into one organization. Um, but you can start with Working um, Equitation United or We United. And I believe it's weunited.com. And that will be, and there's, you can kind of uh, find different groups on Facebook as well with Working Equitation. Um, there are different levels of um, kind of involvement in different parts of the United States. Um, so depending upon where you are, but it is, it is a fast growing sport, I think, because it really, um, it speaks to a lot of people that, you know, it, it really um, rewards good, correct riding, good, correct horsemanship, and, um, and just really, everybody is so supportive of each other. And it's, it's really um, a ton of fun. So um, I highly suggest kind of searching, searching out the groups on Facebook and looking into We United, and you'll kind of be able to track when the uh, fed, two different federations kind of combine into one and kind of see what's going on in your area. Great. That sounds like something people should check out. Yeah. Karina wants to know, we talked a little bit about the manual earlier, but can you talk about the collection options for horses at the end of their life? Yeah. So um, I would definitely suggest, um, you know, you want to pull hair from the root. So you have that. Um, if you have a stallion, um, they can remove the testicles and then you would have to kind of rush those over kind of keep them cool. You don't want to put them directly on ice, but just keep them cool um, and get them over to a facility that knows how to extract it. There's, you can find more exact um, directions on how they want um, the testicles removed, um, but they can remove the semen from there and as well as the ovaries. And your vet should know how to do it, but if, you know, you kind of anticipate having to euthanize a horse, you can, oh, my lights in my office. Oh, no. oh, here we go. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that would be, and at the very least, you know, and again, if you kind of anticipate having to put a horse down and you're able to, you're, there's a university in your area that you can see if they can grow fibroblasts for you um, would be a skin punch um, is what you would want to do. And then there's kind of protocols and procedures um, in regards to that. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah. Anna wants to know, what about passing family knowledge between the horses? Hmm, I'm not sure that I understand that question. I'm not sure. I'm sorry, you know, we don't understand your question. If you want to repost, you know, and clarify a little bit, just let us know. But thank you for asking. Um, from VIP Ranch Equines, does this breed only exist in the USA or have they been exported to different countries? To my knowledge, um, they're just in the United States at this point but it would be super cool in the future <laughs> to, to export them one day. And it is one of our dreams is to compete them um, in Europe in working equitation. So that is kind of a big long range plan, you know, that one day um, we could kind of compete against the big boys in Europe. So dream big. We'll see. Yeah, exactly. Stephanie says, thank you, Christy, for your efforts in the merger and congratulations on all of the success of the SEI horses in the sport. Thank you for your support, thank you. Stephanie. <laughs> thank you so much, Stephanie. Regina asks, I noticed the Santa Cruz sheep is also critical as well as the horse being threatened. Is there a reason? Um, so I don't know a ton about the sheep. I do know that they were removed at the same time that the horses were. Um, 
so I don't think that there was a big effort to preserve the sheep genetics. I believe there's maybe like one sheep or two sheep left that were originally pulled off the island, which is kind of wild because that was almost like 20, over 20 years ago. Um, but I have heard about it sort of recently. I mean, that, that sheep might have passed now. Um, but um, as of 1998, there were no um, livestock left on the island. Um, there, there was a big focus to help. Um, there's a very unique uh, species of island fox. Um, so, and also the um, bald eagle. Um, so both of those species have um, really come back um, in a vital way um, now that all the livestock is gone. So as kind of magical as it was to see the horses on the island, you know, I do understand why um, the National Park Service and the Nature Conservancy um, did what they needed to do. Yeah, just if I can add to Regina's um to answer Regina's question, there are Santa Cruz Island sheep still around. Um, I don't know about the originals who came from the island, but but those animals have been reproduced and they are um, still out there. They're they're in the United States. They are part of our Shave Them to Save Them uh, program. They they have great wool, and we're really working hard to conserve those as well. They they would have a lot of the same characteristics that the Santa Cruz Island horses would like the the hardiness and the adaptability from that period of isolation on a what well, looks like a pretty harsh island atmosphere or environment. There's definitely a little bit more information on our conservation priority list if you wanted to look about the history of the Santa Cruz Island sheep as well. Um, let's see. Anna says, you only speak about genetic DNA, and I know there is other information passed in family bands. Oh, I, I think I know what you mean. Um, you know, it, unfortunately, because of the way we have to um, manage, manage all of our horses, we don't have the room to let them live in family bands. Um, so we have them grouped um, by gender and by age. Um, so there's, you know, you know, in a perfect world, we would have many more acres and we would be able to, um, let them kind of live in a more natural way, but we're, we unfortunately don't have that kind of room. Um, so, but I, I totally now understand what you're talking about and that's not something that, um, our horses are able to, um, our horse is able to live that way. But when we do wean our young ones, we we wean them with kind of an uncle or, you know, an, an older horse that will kind of help teach them, you know, kind of good herd manners and, and kind of the ways of the world. Thank you, Ana. Kate asks, you mentioned that these horses are technically ponies. How tall is the average Santa Cruz horse in your herd? About 13.3 hands. All right. They well, think they're bigger. <laughs> but. Well, that wraps up all of our questions. Is there anything else that y'all wanted to chat about today? Well, I think that's kind of it for me. You know, it's been a weird, a weird couple of months. Um, I think for, you know, obviously for everybody. And we had big show plans this year that got completely scrapped. And what it allowed us to do, though, is kind of really take a step back and dig deep with our training. And, you know, maybe there are a few things that you've been kind of glossing over just to kind of get to the next horse show. And this gave us time to take a few steps back and really kind of fix things that needed to be really properly fixed and and really focus on the next year. And, you know, we had our very first horse show at El Campion Farms and Working Equitation in 2019. And it was, you know, a huge success. And it was, you know, a lot of work, but a lot of fun. And we had planned on doing that in 2020. And um, obviously, we weren't able to do that, but now it just gives us more time to plan an even bigger and better show for 2021, hopefully. And, um, but it has been kind of nice and, 
and kind of has felt decadent to have that kind of training time um, to really dig in and, and work with all the horses and give them give them more time um, instead of trying to just you know kind of get to get to the next show. So I think that for us has been the silver lining in a quarantine. That's so nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time and telling us about these really special horses. They sound quite wonderful. Oh, um, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Christy. We we appreciate what you're doing and keep keep on giving those horses jobs. <laughs> Will do. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank Goodbye, you. everybody. Thank you for Bye. tuning in. We'll be back next week. Um, hope you have a wonderful week. Thanks. <laughs>